from era six for that timing uh, who, who organized this webinar on the topic of uh, Myanmar <clears throat> crisis seen, seen from the border. I think this is this this topic is quite a lot of Okay. Trent, you can. Yeah. Um, yes. Just, just. Uh, uh, Chan Chayan, have you finished your word? No, yet, no, yet. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, uh, I'm speaking uh, for IHASEC, uh, the uh, uh, French Institute, uh, Research Institute based in Bangkok and covering all Southeast Asia, founded 20 years ago. And I'm happy, I'm divided. Partly, I'm happy to open this webinar. Uh, and to uh, uh, welcome all participants, because finally we, we did it, and most of the, the job has been done by uh, Christine with, uh, behind me as the main organizer with uh, Chan Chayan. Uh, but uh, I'm unhappy too, because this wouldn't have been uh, needed if the, the actual situation in Myanmar uh, uh, had been better than it is now. So uh, I think it's an important uh, uh, problem to be discussed now, what happened uh, in the borders, in the Thai, in the borders of uh, uh, Burma now, and Myanmar now. And uh, I hope the discussion between all the participants, David, uh, Sally, uh, Francois, uh, Naika Sao, Mon, uh, Kin Omar, and Giuseppe will be fruitful and we'll bring new insights to uh, all people connected with us uh, tonight. Thank you. Uh, David. Um, so uh, Cheyenne, uh if you'd like to, sorry, we, you, you cut in midstream. So if you'd like to finish your comments and, and then we can begin uh, with the presentation. Well, just briefly, I, I think the, the border situation, particularly between Myanmar and Thailand, <laughs> is a, a very, very challenging and very interesting for us, particularly for the, the speakers tonight to comment upon. Uh, I, I can see that uh, there are some crises uh, at the border. Uh, first of all, it's a political crisis uh, that can be seen uh, from the, the contestation between the EAOs at the top of the door. Uh, the recent uh, clash broke out this morning at Lake Eko also reminds us, us of the beginning of the offensive to be carried out by the second uh, during this, at the beginning of the dry season. And the <clears throat> economic crisis inside the country also so has led to more cross-border migration and human trafficking. I think this is a very important issue at this moment uh, at the border between in Thailand. And of course, this is also followed by the, the uh, COVID pandemic at the moment, uh, coming from movement of the people across the world. The question is how we can provide vaccine to the population who live below the border. Can humanitarian corridor be possible uh, to, to allow international agencies and also ASEAN countries to provide humanitarian assistance to those who, who are needed. And then the last issue is about the refugee camp, the refugees who are still uh, living in, in, the, in, the, in the refugee camps along the Thai border. And last night, there was also a conflict between the refugees and the health volunteer and the camp commanders. It's quite a, a sad 
affects the situation that happened last time. And of course, they are also at the border now, undocumented uh, person, uh, which uh, uh, state investors need to be uh, also pay attention how they can stay safely in time. Right? So there are several issues that need to be discussed and I hope that the speaker, speaker tonight who have specialized have worked on, on these issues would be able to help us to understand the situation uh, uh, clearly. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Cheyenne, for uh, this, th this introduction. Um, the order of the speakers as follows, for those who have now joined, is that we'll start first of all with Sally Thomas, Thompson, rather, uh, followed uh, by Giuseppe uh, de Vincent. Uh, I won't read out their bios, which you've received in the program, simply to say that we have with us, both with Sally and Giuseppe, you know, two very experienced practitioners um, on these questions of humanitarian aid on the borders. Sally with some 25 years of experience, and now as uh, uh, working with the border uh, consortium, uh, which she is the executive director. So Sally, um, let's start with you, get the ball rolling uh, for, for 10 minutes. Thank you. Very good. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Good day to everybody. Um, my thanks to um, Ira Sek and also to Ajahn Chayan at Chiang Mai University for organizing this, this seminar. Um, I have been um, working with the Border Consortium for many years and our sole focus is displaced people from Myanmar. So we are working with refugees in Thailand in the nine camps focused on food security and nutrition. And in Southeastern Myanmar prior to the coup, our focus was on early recovery of conflict affected communities and supporting host communities in areas of potential refugee return. But the situation has uh, taken a significant um, turn for the worse. Uh, in, in this presentation, I'm going to give a very general overview. And then I think through my colleagues and through questions, it will then be an opportunity to go deeper into some of the issues, if I may. So displacement, conflict, humanitarian crises, they're not new in Myanmar, but I think whereas previously, they were largely and most often um, really contained to the ethnic areas. What we're now seeing is it is countrywide. The conflict, the displacement is countrywide and it is affecting everybody from all walks of life within Myanmar. Currently, there are over 600,000 internally displaced people in the country of which around 250,000 have been displaced since the coup in February. And many of those people have been displaced multiple times. In Southeastern Myanmar alone, there are at least 180,000 displaced people unable to return to their homes. And, and given we're, we're based here in Thailand, that is our focus, is essentially Southeastern Myanmar, which covers Southern Shan, Kayak, Yin Mon, and Tanindari regions. So of the displaced in, in um, Southeastern Myanmar, we're not just talking about people who are from the, the ethnic states, but it's also people who have come and fled from the urban areas. We've got activists, journalists, politicians, civil servants, doctors who've been engaged in the civil disobedience movement that have fled into the ethnic controlled areas, seeking protection and to avoid arrest. To date, since the coup in February, over 1,300 people have been killed through the violence on the streets in the towns and cities, all while in detention. And a further 8,000 people remain in detention. They've been, they're either arrested, charged or sentenced. Meanwhile, in the ethnic areas, airstrikes and ground attacks indiscriminately targeting civilians have in turn forced people from the ethnic areas to flee into hiding in the forests and jungles. 
as the ethnic armed groups and now the People's Defense Forces conduct guerrilla attacks against the Myanmar armed forces and some of their strategic installations, we're seeing the Myanmar armed forces more and more in retaliation increasingly target villagers, indiscriminately shelling, looting and destroying property, arbitrarily arresting men, women, and even children, taking people as porters, once again using them as human shields to go in front of troops to be checking for um, landmines. And all this is forcing IDPs to go deeper into the jungles. Many people are living rough in temporary shelters. Some of the people, they risk going back to their homes to gather their supplies. They need to tend to their land, to their livestock, to their livelihoods. And then they bring their supplies and they return to the hiding areas until the next time when they have to move on again. But most people, when they're displaced, they try to stay as close to their homes as they can. They may be displaced multiple times, but they still tend to remain very close to their, um, their point of origin. People living in the ethnic areas, they've lived with conflict for decades. They've developed strategies for survival. They harvest crops at night. They hide their stocks in the forest. Many of them now, they're living in caves. In the Southeast, the humanitarian needs are immense and they're immense across all sectors. The estimates at the moment that there are over 340,000 people just in the Southeast who are in need of vital emergency humanitarian assistance. And it's local networks that have been established through decades of conflict who are responding. They've set up emergency response teams in the, in the Southeast and in the border areas to coordinate assistance to those who need it the most. And it's not need should not just be measured by displacement. There are many host communities, many people who haven't been displaced, who may be in hiding within their own villages, who are also in need. But these local organizations, they've, they've pivoted from the last few years. They, they've been engaged in development activities, but now they're having to go back to providing humanitarian assistance as we see all the gains that have been made during the transitional period to a civilian government in 2015, all these gains have been wiped out and essentially Myanmar is just going hurtling backwards. But the priorities are very basic. It's food, it's protection, it's shelter, it's medicine. But the international community does not have access to the conflict areas. So it is essential to support local organizations to ensure that the displaced have access to food and shelter. It's important that we support ethnic service providers to deliver healthcare and education, even at a time during an emergency. But the challenge for these organizations is to how to scale up their operations and their support structures to enable a whole range of different modalities of deliveries to come in from different entry points wherever you can get access and whoever can get access. But the international community at this time needs to listen to those communities because it's the local communities who know their people best. They know what the needs are. They know where the people are who need it and they know how to deliver it. So for the international community and the donors, we have to be flexible and we have to do what it takes to get the appropriate resources to where they are needed in order to minimize people's displacement and their flight. People cross borders, people cross international borders as a last resort. And the Thailand-Myanmar border is a porous, it's a 2000 kilometer long porous border, but it's rivers, it's mountains, it's rugged terrain, very limited infrastructure 
and in the cold season, the temperatures can drop below zero. With the airstrikes back in March, it forced people to flee into Thailand for their safety. But they were detained at the border by the Thai army. They were only allowed to stay a few days, camped out in the forest until the fighting subsided. And then they were sent back to Myanmar, but only to return again when the airstrikes resumed. Elderly people, pregnant women, women with young children, people with disabilities. These groups are particularly vulnerable at the time of emergency, when flight, when fleeing, when moving fast is really, really critical for survival. But the Thai policy is clear and sharp. Detain people at the border and send back as soon as possible. Thai Thailand is already host to over 80,000 refugees in nine camps, some of whom have been here now over 35 years. And, they do, and the Thai authorities do not want to see a further influx. For new arrivals coming in since February, February into Thailand, since the coup, the international community has not been allowed access. Instead, it has been civil society organizations and local communities who are responding in a low profile way to meet the acute needs of populations in hiding. The refugees, on the other hand, in the nine camps, they receive basic assistance and have access to healthcare and education through a coordinated international humanitarian response. But the challenge for the refugees now in the camps is what is their future? Return is currently not a viable option, but they should not be confined to camps for another 30 years. The Thai economy is heavily dependent on migrant workers from Burma, but the dynamics have shifted with COVID as the borders have been closed and movement restricted. The jobs disappeared, as did remittances going back to Myanmar, which were a vital lifeline to many people living in southeastern Myanmar. But as the COVID restrictions start to ease, there's a potential for an opportunity here for refugees. The labor shortages in Thailand that COVID has created as migrants, as jobs were jobs closed, factories closed, migrants moved back to Myanmar. Now, as the economy starts to, to reopen, it's an opportunity for possibly refugees to perhaps fill those labor shortages. It's an opportunity to find work, to find legal work for refugees in Thailand until such time as they are able to return to Myanmar. So I think what this is saying is that at the moment, what we need to be able to respond to refugees, whether they're in camps, refugees, whether they're in hiding, internally displaced people in border areas or deeper inside Myanmar, it requires an enormous range of responses. There isn't one way, there isn't one route to deliver. We have to look at all the different players, but what we clearly can see is that the first responders are local, local organizations, local communities, and this is essential for the international community in every way we can to get behind them, to support them, if we are going to avoid a humanitarian catastrophe in Myanmar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sally, for, for such a, a passionate but lucid presentation of, of the situation. And I think there are two words that come from what you have to say. It's the complexity of the situation and, and the, the place of Thailand, but that means um, at the local level, but it also means uh, in Bangkok itself with the, with, with the Thai authorities, because in a sense, you know, they have the key, at least to some extent, to allowing this desperately needed humanitarian assistance to go uh, to these local communities. Um, 
Perhaps we'll take questions and comments after the uh, other speakers have spoken. Uh, Giuseppe, if you would like now to make your presentation, please. Thanks, David. And first of all, thanks to Jerome and to Professor Chayan for inviting and apologies in advance if I have to leave earlier than expected, but there was some misunderstanding about the timing. But having said that, let me, let me continue and perhaps provide uh, some historical background, uh, but add to what Sally, Sally so vibrantly um, uh, shared. Let me start to say that Thailand is not neither a signatory of the 1951 Convention for Refugees, nor as a legal framework or an asylum law uh, which regulates, regulates processing, identification, and assistance and support to refugees. Does that mean that Thailand has closed its border? Far from that. Far from that, and history shows that Thailand has been, the, because of its location, of its geographical position, has been over the past uh, more than 40 years, the place hosting waves of refugees from all its neighboring countries, whether it was the result of the Indochinese war with Cambodian, Vietnamese, and refugees, and then Myanmar refugees and Thailand has, has given space, given protection space to hundreds of thousands of refugees over the years. So that, that uh, just to, to, to put that on the record, but however, it's clear that each of these wave is, uh, is extremely sensitive, complicated to handle. And while for some groups in the past solution could be found because the, I mean, solution to refugees requires political solution in the country of origin or, or other, other solution. And as regards Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, there were condition for people, for refugees to return voluntarily and not to be persecuted, Myanmar, unfortunately is remains an unresolved situation and this is what we are observing now let me let me say from a unhcr perspective so we have been uh, working at the border for now uh, almost 20 years in close collaboration with a consortium of ngos who has been providing humanitarian assistance to the camps and in accordance with the UNHCR mandate, we have been trying to expand the protection. So the rule of law, the, 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 the protection regime to ensure that refugees can enjoy uh, some rights and they cannot, are, are not, are not uh, repressed and they can have some space. And in addition to that, look for solution because protracted encampment generation after generation, living on humanitarian hands out, certainly is not the response that we can give to so many people for so many years. And it's in that spirit that uh, when, when we, we thought that Myanmar was finally moving to a transition, sustainable transition, in close consultation with both governments. And in those days, I was based in Myanmar. So I was looking at the situation from the other side. We start promoting on a pilot initial basis, the perspective of a possible voluntary return of refugees. So to put an end to their protracted encampment, and give an opportunity to the young generation to fulfill better their human potential and contribute to the economic development of Myanmar. And let me say that although, although it was a slow process, but with the signing of the ceasefire agreement in Myanmar, with the launch of the political dialogue, with some progress made, the situation started appearing more promising until, until 
first with the COVID, which of course restricted movement, and more recently, of course, with the coup in Myanmar and the re-escalation of violence, very, very unfortunately, so all the plan for a possible voluntary return to Myanmar have, have to be put on the shelf, hopefully temporarily, and now we are facing another potential humanitarian crisis. Now, in, in as soon as the coup started, as soon as the, 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 the coup, I mean, occurred, we were immediately in close consultation and collaboration with all the NGOs who have been operating at the border for so many years with the Thai government. I mean, the first accountable entity and responsible to address a humanitarian, an influx and the response, a humanitarian response, of course, rest the government of Thailand, but the international community stands firm to support the Thai government in this very difficult exercise. So we immediately reached out the Thai government, and we thought their guidance, how would they see the situation, particularly with a view of a possible humanitarian spillover to Thailand. And the, the Thai government has formulated a set of standard operating procedures, which looks at the possibility of a potential influx of refugees and set a number of procedures involving various entity of the Thai government from the Thai army, from the civilian government, possibly the involvement of the international community at some point. And on that basis, again, with, with all the agencies, all the NGOs, we have developed a, a contingency preparedness, contingency response to um, uh, assist the Thai government and to complement the effort of the Thai government to respond to a possible influx. So far, so far since March, and Sally already mentioned, there have been only three temporary influxes as a result of renewed skirmishes, localized skirmishes on the other side of the border, which led in three different waves in groups of thousands of people to temporarily cross into Thailand, particularly from the, uh, in the Meon Son province. But as Sally mentioned, and in accordance with the standard operating procedures of the Thai government, this group was maintained in an area very close to the border, was provided, was managed by the Thai army without any access to international community. And they were persuaded to return back to the other side of the border as soon as the situation was um, considered safe and conducive to a return. So which means when the conflict and the military, the armed tension were abated so that then people could go safely without being put at risk. Beside, beside these three movements, which, which resulted so to this temporary, temporary uh, displacement, this side of the border so far has not been affected by arrival of large number of people. So we remain in a state of preparedness. It's very difficult. Nobody, nobody, of course, is, uh, is, 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 is even thinking or hoping or, of course, in a humanitarian catastrophe in Myanmar, because that would mean, of course, suffering for even more than what they are already suffering. But one has to be prepared because there are a number of indications, of course, coming from Myanmar and the accumulation of factors like expanded violence, a very, very tense and lack of a political dialogue between all different parties, as, uh, as Professor Chayan mentioned, skirmishes, and already in the area of Lake Coco, this is extremely uh, troubling, what, what has happened over the past uh, day uh, over there, just across the border. The, the rampant economic crisis, which is of course affecting, affecting lots of people, combined also with uh, the pandemic, 
the pandemic that with this solution. So these are all different elements that needs to, uh, that, that, that force us to remain as vigilant as possible and continue to advocate with the Thai government. And they, this has been the key advocacy. And I think this is the most important thing to continue to advocate the Thai government to guarantee of opening border as soon as the humanitarian situation on the other side is untenable. And the only way to feel safety, to feel safe for people is to cross the border. That is, that is absolutely a, a, a condition, an important condition, because it's the only way. And of course, granting access to this population to assess their needs, provide humanitarian assistance, assess protection needs, and ensure that there are these, these people who might cross at any time, so that then they can enjoy, they can enjoy the, the right level of protection and enjoy some rights in a, such a desperate situation. I will stop, so this is where, where we are looking. So then I can say just from the other angle that uh, it's true, because we are in regular contact with our colleagues in Myanmar, and it's true that access to, from within Myanmar, whether it is a humanitarian access to reach out population and so on in the area of the Southeast is getting very complex and challenging, very difficult. So that's why the humanitarian provision of humanitarian assistance in all different sectors, it's, it's something that I know that they've been in discussion and so on, but for the time being remains, remains a critical challenge. So leaving, leaving hundreds of thousands of people in uh, dire needs uh, and just stuck in that area. But I will stop here and I will be happy then to take more questions. Thank you. Thank you. And, and, and thank you for actually providing a very helpful uh, kind of balance because we've had the point of view of somebody from, from the NGO community and then somebody from a United Nations organization. And we see very clearly how the synergy uh, of, of activities and of inputs from both sides are so important. But we, once again, we've seen the crucial role of, of the Thai, Thai authorities. Um, if uh, the other, if Francois and uh, Kusumon agree, can there, there's a request to answer to us immediately some questions to Giuseppe and perhaps uh, he will be able to answer also from Sally's point of view. I think Den Chen from the AFP wanted to ask a question. Um, so if you could uh, come in and do so, I'm not sure how I get you to be able to do that because um, this is sort of beyond my Yeah, yes, you are there. Oh, fantastic. Yes. Go ahead. Hi. Um, this question is for uh, Mr. Giuseppe. Thank you so much for um, speaking earlier about the context and the background. Um, I guess this is also related to um, Sal what Sally said earlier, but what we've noticed at least as, um, from a reporting point of view is that um, there's been a lot of arrests um, along that border, the Thai Myanmar border, the, we, the past few months of uh, what they call migrant workers. And what the Thai army and police border authorities are doing is they're labeling them as migrant workers and then processing them and possibly sending them back. So I'm wondering uh, from your perspective of the UNHCR, is there a possibility that some of these, you know, migrants are actually possible refugees or dissidents or people trying to come into Thailand? And uh, do you have a sense of how many there is of that? Um, thank you so much. Shall I answer now or wait for yeah. another question? Okay. I, no. I think you answer now because this is the only question we've got so far. So please answer. Okay. It. No, no, many, many thanks for your question. That is, is very appropriate. Let me let me let me go straight since the very beginning. At the very beginning, immediately after the coup, our assistant high commissioner wrote a letter to all minister of foreign affairs in the region advocating strongly advocating not to send back on a forcible manner Myanmar citizens who were already residing before the coup in 
the countries in these countries, whether legally or illegally, but exactly for the purpose of not sending them back to an areas where uh, there were uncertainty, of course, and there were, there were turmoil. This was the first advocacy that we have had. Whether that has been successful or not, this is a different cup, but then that has, uh, has fed our position, which has been followed by repeated advocacy to at least assess the different needs, because very often the approach of the Thai government has been to consider individual who have been crossing the border as economic migrant or people looking for job opportunities. And this is in the absence of a screening mechanism which assess the needs and the protection needs of the individual and the reason why they've crossed the border could be at variance with the key principle, humanitarian principle of non refoulement whereby people who might be at risk of persecution if sent back should not be sent back. And that has constituted another advocacy at high level, which we keep on engaging the Thai government. And again, have we been successful in that? Well, but that, that not necessarily, but that does not prevent us from continuing to pass these messages and engage more and more with the Thai authority. To come to your question, in the absence of a either government-owned screening mechanism, which assess the protection, or of an international screening, it would be extremely difficult to say if among those who have been sent back as judged as economic migrant, some people with need of protection might have been sent back. And this is, this is certainly a major concern. Is a major concern. On some situation, I can say that due to intervention, thanks to identification of people who might be in need, some people have been not have not sent them back. But I would agree with you that this is an issue that will require more and more advocacy and engagement. So to ensure to ensure a better system to 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 make sure that the international obligation that Thailand has in so many occasions respected, continue to be, to be in place and ensure that uh, those, those who might experience very high risk if sent back to Myanmar are provided with the right protection. And this is where, where we continue to be engaged. And uh, I think also advocacy from all different other groups to, to forge that, that sentiment will be most important. Thanks. Uh, perhaps Councilor Mon yeah. and, and Francois Robin, in, do you want to also add to that, to reply now, or perhaps in your presentation uh, to deal with some of the issues that have just uh, been raised? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. I, I also want to talk a little bit about uh, migration and about that, so, but very lately. So I, now I put first about that issue. At, as you remember that at the beginning of military coup and uh, a violent crackdowns against demonstrators, so the Thai government have set up about 10, over 10 camps in Thailand along the border uh, with Burma, with Myanmar. So they are likely welcome those who are fleeing from the political persecution in Thailand. But uh, no people come in to that, uh, uh, to this come because the pro-democracy activists in the country, uh, the people in the country still, they are not well track to the Thai government and uh, Thai army. So there's, they are worried that they will be pushed back uh, by the Thai authority. So therefore, the program is the program was not success. What I what I have observed during the months April of this year. So uh, yeah, that's it. My adding, adding information to you. 
So uh, now I will start my presentation. Mm -hmm. So we are normally, uh, the situation in Myanmar or in Burma is now like tiny back, like 1990. So the situation happened again, it's very sorrowfully to the people in the country and also the refugee who are not able to return, even though the previous two government in Myanmar uh, one is the USDP government, and the second one is NAD government. They have tried to have the peace dialogues and political settlement and uh, uh, building a nation uh, peacefully. But everything has been destroyed after February 1 coup. So the people get now very hopeless. And then at the same time, they are facing a lot of socioeconomic problem in the country. So in the analysis, we have two types of the, the displacement and uh, population migration into Thailand. The, the first uh, displacement is uh, totally related to the human rights violations and the political oppression. Uh, again, uh, the pro-democracy activists in the country, especially uh, NAD, National League for, Dem for Democracy, uh, their leaders and their elected MP are totally oppressed and they are arrested, they are put in jail and they are imprisoned and they are put on trial. Uh, including the NAD leader Aung San Suu Kyi and the uh, president women as you already have in the information. Beside these the political leaders, so the regime, uh, the military juniors, uh, SAC, very, very targeting the young men and women in the country because they believe these young and men and women is uh, motivated and participated in leading the anti-coup movement so in the entire country. So therefore, uh, hundred, uh, thousands of people are arrested. Uh, many of them are very young. And some of them are involved in the uh, CDM movement. Some of them are participating in the demonstration and some are supporters. So in order to, uh, to have a, a, a political oppression, the SEC also changed many of their law and revived their law. And so especially about four laws is revised. So the first law they revised is about penal laws, uh, penal codes. Penal codes is normally the people who are on the street uh, going on untied military coup is normally they, they are putting into 505B, like defaming, defaming the state or something like that. And another one is a, a privacy, privacy law. Privacy law is normally, uh, that law is uh, regulated during the NID government in 2017 in order to provide more privacy rights. But during the SEC after coup, uh, this law is uh, like revised, and uh, the regime or security force have res they can they can go every uh, any house and they can arrest the people without warrant or like uh, no need from the judge to sign a warrant to arrest the people or to kill the people or etc. So they provide the law, and the third one, the electronic law, is normally the. If one young person, one person is going on the street and they, uh, they, they curse them and they search their phone or their computer. So if they found something, some evidence that is related to the anti coup, they can be arrested uh, suddenly. That is uh, permitted by the SEC to the security force. The third one, uh, the last one is about the uh, administration law is normally 
the ad, uh, village or town or village track administrator, they already have, they have responsibility to inform who is involved in the entire coup to the, to the nearest, uh, nearest uh, the, the military outpost or the police force. Therefore, the regular and regular arrests in the community happen and uh, shooting into the demonstrator or uh, another arrest related to the Pentecost and the framing laws uh, happen all the time. So that's made many, many young people have to flee into the internet arm con uh, organization control area, EU control area. And then at the same time, the Burmese army have attacks, attack the internet arm EO control area and they burn down the village and they, they drop the bomb into the community. So, so we see two types, uh, the local community, local internet community who are receiving uh, pro-democracy activists are the same suffer. So they both suffer in the in the one area. So now, at first, uh, our knowledge that uh, EEO help, help provide protection for thousands of uh, displaced persons, including the pro-democracy activists, uh, Gen uh, Generation Z and other uh, the CDM staff in their control area. So, and then they have to feed them, they have to provide a shelter for them. And at the same time, they have to provide medical care for them. And at the same time, they have to provide from the military attack uh, by the Burmese army. So this, this type of the, the EU now has, now they have played a very important role in the protection of those uh, displaced population. This is, uh, this is one, uh, one issue. The second issue is about migration, as, as, uh, as you already raised about the migration problem. So in the situation in Myanmar, the socioeconomic situation is very bad. So even in the COVID uh, pandemic during, during uh, how is it, June and July to August, September. So the SAC, they don't care about the COVID patient. In the community, you have to treat by your, yourself. You have to find out your oxygen tank uh, the hospital are not operates and isolation center or quarantine centers normally set up by the community, by the people. So, uh, but we are proud because we appreciate because the people in Myanmar, in Burma, they have to take care by themselves, you see. Uh, studying like you, you will see like the nugget problem in 2008, until now, the people could not rely on the government. Now, especially on the military regime, so they could not rely on them. So the people have to find themselves to set up quarantine center and have to send uh, transport the patient and they have to find out uh, the, 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 the oxygen tank or other things. So, so in this situation, so the people have to be empowered themselves in order to provide service for those who need in the community. Is it very similarly happened in the ethnic uh, arm control area, uh, EU control area. So the ethnic uh, service providers are the main organization who have been helping the COVID patient and other, other people. So another problem is political crackdowns and economic crisis in the country because of the, the, the community price high up 50%. And the uh, HA rate between the time bar and the uh, Nyamajas has increased about 30% or uh, 40%. The people have been very difficult. The gasoline uh, increased up to 40%. The people have find very difficult situation to live in their, in their native village. Therefore, they're trying to go into Thailand trying to cross into Thailand. So now the Thai police force and Thai army arrest, uh, arrest illegal migrant worker between 200 to 1,000 along the Thai-Myanmar border. 
from Mae Hong Son to go down uh, the, the, the Renong area. So it's a, we read daily news, but the people, they could no longer stay at their home because they have no more food, they have no job. They have, uh, they have lost their family member during, uh, during the COVID problem. So the people have to go. And then the Myanmar government or SEC, they don't have any program to, to send out the people legally, like with the MOU system, agree with the Thai government. So this is another problem. The people and also the people are afraid the military government and the, the, the military authority to make their passport and to have MOU and to go across into Thailand legally, according to the requirement by the Thai government. So the people have no choice. The people have to cross the border. The people have to be paid. They have to pay uh, uh, 50, 50,000 up to 25,000 baht for one person to the human trafficker. So then they try to get into Thailand or to Bangkok or to Ranong or to uh, Somosakon. So they know the problem in Thailand, the COVID problem is very serious. The Thai government is serious. And then a loss of uh, transmission uh, uh, pandemic in Thailand, but they know, but they have no choice. They had to cross into Thailand because of uh, to take care of the family back in their home. So in this situation, so we found two problems. One is a serious humanitarian crisis for the displaced population in the EEO control area, especially Newmont State Party, Korean National Union, Ashan, uh, K Karenni National Progressive Party, and also Shan Group and this is in Southern Nima, what I'd like to mean. Another problem is migration. So a lot of migration, uh, illegal migration happen. So that's it. We are very needing to the international community how to solve the problem, how to persuade Thai government to consider seriously in this situation when uh, there are many, many crises in Myanmar. Bama, thank you. Thank you very much for that, uh, for your presentation, because I, I think it's absolutely crucially important that we hear uh, the voices of those the most affected. They're the people of, of Myanmar itself. And I found it very complimentary and, and uh, to for the presentations of Sally and, and Giuseppe a little bit for, for, from the outside that's seen from the inside, the actual day-to-day -day problems are that force people reluctantly um, to, to, to leave their homes and, and to become displaced uh, across borders or within the country itself. Um, unless there are direct questions for Kosumon, uh, perhaps we can go to the next uh, speaker, uh, Francois Robin. Um, and uh, continue uh, our discussion. Yes, uh, uh, I want to thank, uh, thank you so much, uh, Adan Chayan and uh, Jérôme Samuel and uh, Christine Cabasse for giving me opportunity to participate to this uh, conference. So while keeping the Burmese crisis at the, as a backdrop, my presentation is focused around the notion of border. Ne za or ne cha or ne ne in Burmese language. Whether it is called border, frontier, or even boundaries, a border, the term chosen by the organizer, organizers of this conference, a border is by definition a passage. Crossing a border refers to the terminology. It needs to be qualified to designate the migrants, Shui Piang, Netang, Tumia, whatever they are migrants workers, Shui Piang, Lotema, or refugees, Dokade, 
call also Nanaye Kolon Kui if they are engaged in a process of official recognition of their status. As a French anthropologist, Frédéric Fogel, Fogel says, rightly about paperless people, it is important not to essentialize these terms. Being a refugee, an exile worker, or a paperless migrant is not an identity. It is a provisional status. Crossing the border cannot be reduced to the geographic situation on each side of the state frontier. Following the French anthropologist Michel Agier, I argue that any crossing that is not part of outside to take to gain consistency in terms of socialization. This is the point I want to show by taking the example of the enclaves of migrant workers in central Bangkok compared to other and better known contexts in which migrant workers are involved. Let me first remind very shortly the historical background of the Burmese dynamics of trans transnational migration. It is important to highlight the fact that if contemporary Myanmar leaks like a peace pipe, the immigration process has to be placed on the long term of the Myanmar crisis since independence and the Pinlong agreements. Whether in Chin state, in Kachin state, or in Shan states, the village in the highlands of Burma where I have carried out surveys are in demographic decline. The process concerns, concerns mainly the prime age population, namely the age group between 15 and 45 years old. In the case of the usual and seasonal border crossing, way and back on each side of the border, we are dealing with a sort of social contract based on the periodicity of departure and return to the homeland. It may be also the case regarding the urban, urban exile towards the main cities of Burma. As soon as the neo urbanites maintain contact with the family in the highlands, either directly by space but regular visits, the role of the monthly sending of money or annual visits at the time of the New Year's, the Jan or Songkram, for example, or indirectly via the civil society, care, educative, administrative associations or religious networks. For various, for different reasons, including the regulation of recruiting companies and administrative pressure in migratory matters, the possibilities of integration for displaced people and migrants are very rarely met, to put it mildly. Burmese immigration takes place at two levels of analysis. On the one hand, that inherent in the Burmese context, and on the other hand, that inherent in the emergence of an integrated ASEAN area. First, endogenous factor, the Burmese context or Myanmar context. It will be a it will be a mistake to reduce migratory flows to dictatorship alone. 
neither the democratic transition nor the post-independence liberal regime or of UNU prevented, prevented the development of migration. The federal policy on a racial basis since 1948, with an intensification from one constitution to another one, is at the origin of seven de decades of civil war, terror, and pauperization of the people. The current revolt at the end of the 1940s launched the movement. The Rohingya drama constitutes a landmark of Muslim xenophobia in the country. And since 1st February, the making of the enemy, to, to mention uh, Mary Callahan, since the 1st February, the making of the enemy is now extending, extended to the entire Burmese population not only one or other one ethnic groups, the entire Burmese population becomes the enemy of the Tamado. That federal, that federal policy on a racial basis explains the migratory dynamics affecting for four decades, mainly remote, remote and borders region, but not only remote region. This context of exclusion, which is increasingly entrenched year after year, has led in recent years to exponential increase in the intensity of migratory flows. I'm not underestimating the difficulties encountered at borders. But it goes without saying that the intra-Asian migratory flows extend well beyond the border region between two neighboring countries. Second exogenous factor of migratory migrant flows, the establishment of the ASEAN Economic Community 2015 was a decisive incentive vector in the development of the migratory flows. Intra-Asian migrations exploded to the point of competing with the national networks of Isan manpower towards Bangkok. Significantly, migrants from Burma, Laos, and Cambodia came to replace the Isan networks which had, had until then been the main suppliers of cheap labor in Bangkok megalopolis. I'm sorry, it's very noisy. With 55% of the reception of migrants in the ASEAN area, Thailand is a leader far ahead of Malaysia and Singapore. The intra-Asian form of these migratory flows combined with the exponential develop developments over the past two decades, and more particularly over the past five years, find their explanation in the combination of political, the Burmese dictatorship, economic, the development of Asian megalopolis, and health parameters, the COVID. Back to the idea of crossing the border. The refugee issue is very different depending on the context. In Delhi, Julie Boja has very clearly explained that the acquisition of a refugee status for Chin refugees is, a, is recurrent. The challenges involved in the refugees comes on Bangladesh side and those on Thailand side cannot be compared, of course. In the recent volume, Moving Around Myanmar, Arawat Rarouen has shown that the difficulty of choosing between continuing to work or preserving one's refugee status 
giving access to the refugee camp. Among the migrant workers in the enclaves um, of Bangkok, the refugee question does not arise. Only once did, you, did a young man, a young woman, tell me, tell me that her husband went in Kuala Lumpur to work first officially, then illegally. It was then because of this, his recent paperless status that he initiated the procedures with the UNHCR. As a refugee, he obtained the green card and has since worked in a factory in the USA. Becoming a refugee becomes an a posteriori strategy. Actually, all the construction workers met in the enclaves say they have crossed the border for economic reasons. Workers on construction sites earn at least three times more. In Thailand, it was, uh, uh, last time I have been there, it was in 2019. Workers on construction sites earn at least three times more in Thailand than in Burma. Based on an based on an estimated average salary of 9,000 up to 11,000 Thai baht per month, including overtime. On that salary, some 4,000 Thai baht months is reserved for the remit, for the remittance for the family in charge of the child care. That amount of the remittance is roughly a third, sometimes a half, of their salary. Useless to say that the budget balance is quite complicated. Indebtedness reasons are many, among which medical costs, cost of making papers compliant, cost of travel up to border to have the papers endorsed, undue payments to endless official administrative procedures and numerous police checks. Sums requested by essential, essential intermediaries. Expenses related to returning home, if possible, once a year. Loaning money to a friend or simply the cost of daily living in Bangkok in debtless is recurrent among the migrants, workers in the end class. Debt is a recurring trap from which the construction workers living in the enclave struggle to escape. Indebtedness interrupts quickly the regularity of sending money, which is the only reason for crossing the trans transnational border. Without underestimating again the trauma represented by, in a certain case by crossing the border. It is not in itself the, pass, the passage from one side of the state border to the other side that pose a problem on the long term. As soon as there is more or less a scheduled return. It is not so much a question of geographical distance, depending on whether one is in Mesut, Bangkok, or Dubai, that is problematic. The scope of the drama, of the human drama, its deep nature, is measured on the one hand, according to the possibility or not, of weaving social bonds. On the other hand, to place this bond in the frequency of its occurrences. That is, in the capacity for displaced people to develop and renew a sense of, of community belonging. Whether it is through the periodicity contained in the educational 
health or administrative offer made available to migrants by NGO, whether it is through religious offer made available in Bangkok, and they are quite that's why you're you seem to be stuck your mic microphone in the image okay. Or is it the same? You don't hear me? Yes, you seem to be back, but try keep, keep going. Okay, okay. What matters is the possibility or not of a family reun reunification, the possibility or not of benefiting from an educational health or administrative offer through NGO, the possibility of meeting in places of worship. In short, beyond proximity and geographical distance, what matters is the possibility of registering the frequency of meetings. From this point of view, the industrial cities which are multiplying on the outskirts of Bangkok the city of Mesut, the little Burma, and its numerous uh, IT companies owned by Burmese, mostly by Burmese migrants. And even as far as I understand, the refugee camps on the border, all these places have in common the possibility, however minimalist, of social life. Actually, it is what differentiates these places from urban enclaves. The urban uh, enclaves in Bangkok, in center of Bangkok, appeared at the turn of the 2000s, with an exponential development from 2015. The enclaves of central Bangkok are ephemeral spaces par excellence. Insatiable consumers of disposable labor. With all the nuances that should, of course, be introduced, the enclaves of the city center stand out in this respect from the industrial zones located on the outskirts of Bangkok. Of Bangkok. Just as they are distinguished from the refugee camps on the, on the Burmese border, where the areas of socialization are kept to a minimum. Three criteria prevail in the desocialization process observed in urban enclaves. First, the mobility of places and people which hinder any community form formation. The enclaves must be dismantled and reassembled elsewhere when the land on which they are temporarily located, located becomes constructible. The duration of an enclave varies from a few months to several years. Second, the reglementation, the imposed rule one person equal one job equal one roof, which hinders any community reunification and the breakup of families. In the end class, there is no spouse, is one of the two has no, no contract, working contract. In the end class, there is no uh, child, children, if they they are not able to work on the uh, to work. Three, the distancing with regard to the associative environment, however important in Bangkok. 
In the associative and family solitude of the barracks, no form of mutual aid is able to alleviate the spirit of death. I will say in conclusion that the urban enclaves are representative of one of these new capitalist and liberal forms of treat treatment of migrants. What prevails here structurally is family breakdown, isolation within the city generalized social distancing. Here in the enclaves, border crossing is no longer allowed. The border becomes an insurmountable wall. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Francois. Uh, this is a wonderful, uh, uh, more academic presentation, which I think once again complements uh, the kind of other accounts we've had, the other presentations, which are more those of people witnessing uh, the, uh, the, the consequences of borders and of refugees. And I think what's important in your presentation is the, the issues you raise existed prior to the coup d'etat of the 1st of February and will continue uh, once, hopefully, uh, the uh, political situation in, in Myanmar is, is resolved and there is a restoration uh, of democracy because in such a happy ending, perhaps such a happy state, the, these questions of economic refugees um, will still uh, continue. Um, I think that, uh, I, I, that um, Kin Omar is now with us. If you could uh, put your microphone on and your, your video, I can see that you're now present. Um, if you'd like to make your presentation and then we can have some, uh, we can move into the, the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Um, I'm so sorry for really challenging um, technical uh, difficulty that I had. Uh, encounter at this time, first time using the Zoom. I don't know what really happened. So I'm not even so sure where the program is right now. So I'll try my best to fill in my part and, and contribute uh, from my end for the uh, fruitful discussion among us. Uh, thank you first, thank you for having me. Um, just very quickly, a brief introduction of myself. I, I've been, a, I'm a, a Burmese human rights demo and democracy activist. Um, I've been a part of the, the Myanmar People's Struggle for Democracy since 1988, started as a student. So my, you know, like uh, my pretty much my day and night um, for the past 35 years, um, it's been with this movement. So um, yeah, like, so I just, if I may just start saying that the, the current human rights and humanitarian crisis in our country of course, it's not a new phenomenon because all of us who follow Brahman Yama know very well and all this round of, you know, like a refugee flow, internal, internally displaced people, democracy activists flee in the country. That's been quite a repetition, uh, especially starting from our generation in 1988. And um, I was one of those uh, democracy activists who had to flee uh, into the, um, the ethnic armed revolutionary areas, or we call as a liberated area that many of the activists right now have fled and taken the refuge. Um, but also, um, you know, in 1990s, there were large, uh, large, displacement, large displacements like in Shan, Karan, Mon, and Karani uh, that really, you know, like follow our round of people fleeing the country um, due to the, the, the military's folk, folk cut and scorch earth campaigns against the ethnic na nationalities armed resistance movement. And then later on in the you know, past decades, you know, those of you who follow you will remember there were smaller waves of democracy movements carry on with the ongoing uh, imprisonment of the uh, activists, while many also fled to the border, especially to the Thailand border, 
due to their ongoing resistance being brutally crushed down by the previous military regime, such as the Saffron Revolution in 2007, led by the Buddhist monks. And there was a round of clearance operations against the Rohingya minority, also took place in western part of the country in Rakhine state, with more than 200,000 Rohingyas had to flee uh, across the border to Bangladesh. That was in 1992. But, but the gravity of the crisis across the country that we've seen and witnessed for the past 11 months, almost 11 months today, that the military has caused this ongoing, you know, has caused in its um, in their ongoing brutal coup attempt to take over the country, that crisis really reached to the breaking point um, that have never seen in our country before. Um, every day, the the hunter commits acts of terrorism, as defined by the international experts like the Special Advisory Council for Myanmar, who look into the um, the international definition of the terrorism, the acts of the terrorists. And, and we have seen since the attempted coup on February 1, this military has killed in cold blood at least 1,340 people, including around 100 children and has detained nearly, um, they arrested uh, nearly 11,000 people. Right now is close to uh, more or less, I think it's close to 8,000 uh, remain in the prison right now, in detention right now. Many of them have, most of them are, are facing severe torture and they don't have a, a contacts with the families and there are no real uh, human rights lawyer who will be able to do anything much, especially that the military can go called, what can they really do? So since September, the, the, the military has been ferociously and systematically also shelling the, and burning the particularly targeting the western part of Myanmar, the Chin state, and also the upper part of Myanmar, the upper region in Magui and Sagai, where the, the resistance and defiance against their coup attempt been very, very strong. So the, the resilience and resistance so strong, so the, 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 the Honta is really like deliberately targeting also targeting the civilians indiscriminately widespread and systematic. And they are burning down the villages, the whole villages, the whole town had to flee, you know, the internally displaced people population. Again, this is a new round we're talking about, is more than 250,000, getting close to 300,000 newly displaced, according to our local partners, um, civil society uh, documenters on the ground. That might be a bit different from the UN uh, data, um, but also there's a uh, recurrence of the, the, the very um, severe uh, violence attacks by the military, um, but he, particularly also uh, targeting the women, the ethnic women, uh, like there were a case of two Chin women, rape and gang rape. One, one uh, woman just gave birth a month ago before that, and also a, a, another one was seven month old, I mean, seven month pregnant. And there were cases of the, also sexual violence and, and rape also being reported in Kachin and Shan in the eastern part of the country, while also women and LGBTIQ activists in detention are also facing sexual assaults and sexual violence. And then there were also, you know, like uh, this very um, inhumane acts of the military hunter, such as like, you know, like uh, the open fire and run a military vehicle or the, you know, civilian, in the civilian vehicles that, that they actually were uh, uh, riding driving and they run they run their vehicles into the peaceful protesters like killing people and and there was a one recent case just like a, a, a 10, 10 days ago and that was not the first but also just they, they actually uh, arrested more people I mean that is pretty much the pretty much the manhunt is day and night so one freelance photojournalist who was among those who were arrested on on December 5th, was actually uh, tortured to death in less than three days of the arrest, and many end up in uh, end up being killed, of, uh, you know, of die from the torture. Um, and also, there are also cases of the terrorist act that we are also uh, seeing. There is a mass killings, mass killings, not only the mass killings by shooting, but also setting the people uh, on fire alive. That includes the minors, like fourteen years old and fifteen years old. Um, the conflict across the country now has reached to the level that we have never seen before. Also because people are left with no way of defending themselves with the outside support. 
no it, no UN, no international community is coming and able to stop the military violence. So they are left with no other option but to exercise their right to self-defense. And they are doing the defense um, activities and defense war with whatever that they are able to hold to protect themselves for their life and also the life of the their communities and families. I want to show you very quickly, um, if that's okay, uh, David. I have three slides that I want to show. I share. Um, if, may I do that? Can I do that? Yes. No. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure. Oh, okay. How okay. you? Okay. I. I, I will. I will do it. I will do it from my end. Um, and please let me know if you see that. Can you see it? Uh, yes. Yes, we oh, can. You can begin. I just have. I just have. Yes, I just have the three slides. I just want to show. This is actually documented by our partner Altsy and Burma. Uh, uh, this is the the real time um, uh, uh, data of the conflicts uh, from the AC LED. So you will see between February and October, then you see also how the, 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 the conflict, um, you know, the attacks, not the conflict, att attacks targeting the civilians really uh, skyrocketed. I mean, it, this is actually, the number is more than uh, 500 percent, 500 percentage from last year in the same time. Then if you look at this, um, and Myanmar actually, uh, Myanmar reached to the, the third priority or the uh, yeah, third priority agenda of the Security Council. And you see that Myanmar is between Syria, Afghanistan, and Yemen. And you can see the escalation from February to October from the, the 209 attacks all the way to 779. So, and then um, you can see on the map also um, how the, the attacks are actually uh, increasing. In fact, yeah, now it's 632% increase from the same period from 2020. And that's how the, uh, the, um, the uh, conflict uh, actually is spread across the country. In fact, it's pretty much you know, like every day there's a fighting. And just today at 11 a.m. Uh, on your time zone uh, in, in, uh, in Asia, in uh, Thailand, Myanmar side, uh, Myanmar time, there was already another uh, uh, fresh fighting uh, near the Thai border in the Karen National Union area. Uh, where the uh, I just learned before this uh, uh, webinar, there are like at least ten uh, Myanmar soldiers actually. Um, uh, Myanmar soldiers uh, uh, work work uh, uh, died from the fighting with the Karen um, army. So coming back to my point, let me end this. Um, stop. Um, okay, and then I just yeah. Sorry, let me just close this. So what I want to really say is that the, the hunter that we're dealing, uh, of course, the leadership change, and it's pretty much the same institution with the same doctrine, with the same agenda, how they want to rule the country and how they want to uh, stay on to the power and taking control, not only the politics, but also the businesses, the economy. So basically, um, we're dealing with, we're, we're really dealing with a, a criminal gang. In, and in fact, it they are, actually uh, outlawed by the Myanmar, Myanmar national law that they are a terrorist organization and, uh, and uh, Myanmar's national law. And that's been uh, already declared by the duly elected government and also the parliament. Um, one thing that I want to raise is also very, very quickly on that, you know, we talk about the human rights violations happen in this country forever. But now we have to come to the point of realizing that such violations are so systematic, widespread and persistent and this actually now are uh, atrocity crimes and they amount to the atrocity crimes because they deliberately target the civilians widespread and systematically. And they, these crimes amount to crimes against humanity and war crimes. And in, in such serious violations of international law that leaves our people left with no nothing but to defend themselves, but also the severity is the lack of human security. And this is something that I would like to actually call for your solidarity and support and how do we address to actually end this violence and, and, and uh, bring the, the, the human security for the people of Myanmar. I mean, the Myanmar, Myanmar uh, situation cannot be treated as before. 
I think that's the point that I would like to make. So just to end my point is we really need the international community to be decisive and acting. And of course, there you, you see in the past 10 months and now getting to close to the end of the year, we don't really see the concrete actions, particularly from the world body like the United Nations or from the ASEAN. But I think what we really need is the, the neighboring countries, if we can really convince the neighbor, neighboring countries like Thailand or India, if they will be able to, uh, you know, if they will be, uh, if they will actually um, uh, collaborate with the uh, civil society, including of the civil society of their own countries, in their countries, as well as with the international actors and like-minded uh, countries, government, I think there is a chance to save the life on the ground and, and you know, like uh, stop the father bloodshed and, and also stop the, 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 uh, the, the military's violence. I think we would like to see more um, international communities step up more. Yes, of course, you know, even in the last week, you will see the US, UK and Canada can, uh, governments step up with the like increased targeted sanctions against the military, particularly targeted the uh, military's departments that procure the uh, arms and ammunition, as well as like, you know, um, uh, production of the defense, uh, defense materials, defense industries, for example. It's, it's, it's taken to that point of cutting the financial flow to the military, but it's not enough yet because the, the very world's uh, highest authority body, such as the Security Council, continue to fail to act. And I think we have a challenge because especially, you know, having China and Russia there, we're not able to push to for the Security Council to be able to act as accordingly, according to their, you know, uh, their mandate. I think it's very, uh, quite a challenge, but we need to be able to see like-minded countries like the Australia, New Zealand, I think we need to see more of these democracies, countries of democracies to really like, you know, like, a, like a step up and, and take you know, this um, Myanmar crisis, not to get you know, like further to the point of like, you know, becoming a failed state, which nobody wants to see it. But I think also for the ASEAN in particular, they need to also really understand that you know, it is in their national interest that they need to actually take the side with the people of Myanmar who are sacrificing everything that they have, you know, for their better future, for peace and stability in their country, which is going to be the peace and stability for the ASEAN itself too. And also for the ASEAN's, you know, community development pro uh, program that they've been wanting to achieve. But unless they hold this Myanmar military to account and stop the Myanmar military violence and bring the democracy back, there is no way for ASEAN to move forward either. So I think with that, I would just end here. Um, sorry if anything that I said already been said by my previous uh, speakers, if I were just repeating, I'm really sorry about this, but I will just end here, David, thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, because uh, showing your graphs, I think was, was important. Uh, you know, we've had prior to your presentation, more of a sort of the witnessing of, of people uh, uh, talking about the situation on the border, but to actually see some figures, there are cold and statistics are always cold, but they do give us a, a clearer sort of overall picture of what is happening. I was also pleased that you touched upon the situation on the borders near Chin State and the, the Sagan region, uh, because uh, again, in previous presentations, we've talked mainly about the border with Thailand, the eastern borders, uh, and not the western border. So I wonder if you could say something more about the situation uh, on the border with, with India. Um, it, may I say that I'm extremely disappointed by the Indian reaction since the coup. I mean, India does claim to be the world's largest democracy, at least... Uh, the Thai Prime Minister doesn't make that kind of claim, uh, you know, about uh, about uh, about Thailand, uh, and yet um, the, the you know India has not really been you know very active, or and in fact has been somewhat of a dead weight uh, in 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 moving forward on the situation in in uh, in Myanmar. So could you say something more about the situation on the on the western borders? Uh, and 
in, 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 in there, what can the inter international community do? So it's a question also uh, to, to the other uh, speakers, or the other panelists, rather. Shall I start um, in response to that? Sure. Um, thanks for this question, David. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, you know, like the the unfortunately in like India, Indian governments. You know, as you said uh, rightly, the world largest democracy. Um, you know, the erosion of democracy in India, in fact, is um, impacting our people's struggle for democracy, and that is no doubt about it. In our time back in 1988, you know, the the foreign minister of India. The uh, really like accepted us, welcomed us, you know, uh, opened the door, really promoted for democracy in Myanmar. But then now you really see that those who are fleeing the military violence across the border to India side are being pushed back. Um, the the central government, in fact, you know, being uh, the Indian government, being uh, uh, India is now one of the Security Council member. And, and unfortunately that, you know, along with like a country like Vietnam, you know, joining the club of Russia and China. So you don't really see them, you know, being um, uh, pro for the democracy movement or like, you know, let alone also to address this issue of the human security, which is very um, disheartening to see. Um, right now, the, the, the people who are fleeing um, from the Northwest of Myanmar, um, well, the areas where the the military hunter is targeting not every though not many areas don't have a chance to get cr crossed get to the point of to cross the border to india it's quite far uh in terms of the 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 uh communication you know like a a, a a possibility but those who are close to the border yes they have already um crossed the border to the india side and there are like two um, states kind of uh, uh, bordering with uh, Northwest Myanmar, Manipur and Mizoram. So Manipur government is really bad. So they just push people back. Whereas the Mizoram state government uh, seems more sympathetic and welcome and, and receiving some, um, even including, you know, like uh, 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 providing, um, allowing the uh, those who fled to receive the COVID vaccines, but it's not enough though. I mean, um, the humanitarian aid, uh, because of this full cut uh, campaigns by the military hunter, where the, 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 the Chin state is severely targeted with all, all of these egregious crimes, um, atrocity crimes. So people are, are fleeing their towns and cities, uh, uh, towns and, and villages, and then they are in the, forest but then they have nothing really while they are not even able to uh, buy the basic needs such as the rice and you know whereas the UN agencies or the INGOs don't have access to those areas they cannot they cannot go I mean the UNACR tried for a couple of times to one town they were not successful they were blocked they were turned back you know they were allowed to only uh, uh, distribute a, a teeny like a minimum uh, uh, um, uh, group of people to receive a minimum aid, whereas the large uh, population in need have no way of having access to that. I mean, that's another thing that we need to talk about because like I said, the humani humanitarian crisis is further deepening. And yet the military is the one who is destroying the aid, blocking the aid, destroying the um, uh, health system, also the uh, targeting the health workers, you see? So, uh, I mean, people are really like helping out each other. There are civil society uh, transforming or like changing the new form and new, um, you know, way of doing things and that they're very risky circumstances. Whereas also the medical doctors are also trying, medical workers are trying their best uh, to uh, support and give service to the people. So, and uh, the very risky circumstances where they will get shot and killed and imprisoned and tortured, people are really striving so hard caring for each other. But what we really need is these people need to be supported by the international actors, international humanitarian actors, UN agencies. And we have the agency, we have the local agency, we have the local capacity. We also have the civil society and local networks who get the trust from their own communities. But what we need is the flexibility and also the trust that we need the international actors to place in the hands of the local actors on the ground. That's what we are needing. Thank you.
Um, would some of the other panelists like to uh, intervene on that point of um, uh, of what is happening on the western border and the, the place of, of India? No. Um, do we have some other questions. I've been asked uh, a question myself, but I don't want to uh, monopolize or to, to abuse if I already had my, my situation. Uh, Kasu Amman, did you want to say something more on the, on the situation on the Western border? Uh, no, no, I, I agree with Kilma. I don't know much the situation in Western Myanmar, but uh, similarly in Eastern Myanmar, in Eastern Myanmar border is, uh, Similarly, the people have capacity, the CSO, CBO organization have capacity and the uh, service organization and the uh, arm attendant arm control organization have uh, their own capacity. So what we need is uh, understanding what she said uh, from the international community and cross border aid to those people. So uh, they can do their best for their community, for the people who are suffer because of uh, civil war in our country. Thank you. If I could just add to that, um, that as in the case of what is occurring on the Thai border, on the on the Thai side, the internal poli political situation, <clears throat> from what I can gather, is, is is relatively stable. We don't have in you know Thai insurgencies. Whereas on the western border in Mizoram and, and all of the northwest, you know, there are insurgencies which have been supported within Myanmar itself. So it's the instability with, within northwestern, um, northeastern rather, uh, India, uh, that sort of has an effect on the way that the Indian government and the local governments react uh, to uh, refugee crisis provoked um, since the coup, um, which are forcing people, those close to the border, as, as Kinoma suggested, um, uh, to, to move into, across the border, into those northeastern states of, of, uh, of India. Um, yeah. Like Mizoram state, yeah. The yeah, yeah. refugee from Myanmar, yeah. Um, uh, are there other uh, questions or points re related directly to the, the question of refugees and, and, and borders? Uh, please feel free to, uh, to ask your question. Um, if there's not, I shall perhaps ask the question that I've been asked, which is as uh, an international relations comparative politics person, um, what is the impact uh, of since the coup or on the situation in, in ASEAN and will these, uh, this refugee situation uh, lead to a change in the ASEAN approach? Now, as you are as aware, ASEAN had, in April, some three months after the coup, in, uh, introduced its five principles, the five point consensus. Uh, none of those points have actually been achieved. The first of the point was that um, uh, the the regime, the junta, should accept uh, a, the visit of the ASEAN special envoy. Uh, that visit has virtually been denied because um, the junta uh, refused access to Aung San Suu Kyi uh, and other uh, imprisoned political leaders. Uh, and uh, following that, um, in I think it's in August, uh, the ASEAN sort of withdrew its invitation for the junta to be uh, to be present at the at the ASEAN summit. Sorry, that was in October. There was another step in in ASEAN about the special envoy, uh, in which uh, the the junta was leader was present, uh, but uh, then went back and basically you know, said, well, I'm not going to take into account any of the, the points that have been made and the requests from my ASEAN colleagues. So then that led in October to uh, the, uh, the association ASEAN for the first time, uh, refusing to invite uh, a representative from, from the regime 
governing one of its members. In this case, they refused, they denied a, a, an invitation to Min and Lung uh, to attend that summit. Now, this can be interpreted in three ways. Uh, it can be interpreted firstly as a courageous act, uh, showing that you know the association ASEAN is willing to take and try and deal with the problem. Uh, it can be uh, simply seen as giving the regime time out, you know, allowing it to buy time, which it has done uh, since the beginning of the coup in uh, 1st of February. And or it can be seen as washing, uh, ASEAN washing its hands of the matter. Uh, I'm more partial to the second and third interpretation. I think that this obsession with ASEAN centrality is misleading. Centrality can mean two things. It can either mean positioning, okay, we're central, okay, or it can mean capacity. And uh, frankly, I do not see ASEAN itself having the capacity of bringing about a return to the democratic transition in Myanmar. It doesn't have the capacity, it doesn't have the carrots and the sticks to bring about a change in the behavior of the junta. And frankly, does it have the political will? I mean, what interest is there for the Cambodian Prime Minister Hun Sen or for the time Prime Minister Prayut uh, to have a flourishing democracy on its borders? Uh, you know, that may give some unfortunate ideas, you know, to. Um, to democratic forces within their countries itself. So, uh, which has led me to the conclusion that what is required is what I would call a good cop, bad cop approach. Um, I would advocate as Francois and others have for the recognition of the national unity government by Western countries and let you know ASEAN continue in not recognizing the NUG, but at the same time not rec recognizing uh, the uh, uh, the military junta either. We need to level the playing field politically. Um, you know the the military has a monopoly of heavy weaponry, uh, of uh, of control at least of uh, a large proportion of the territory. Uh, and that is not the case for the forces of, of democracy, the ethnic armed organizations, etc. So I think we've got to think in terms, relying on ASEAN uh, to solve the problem is, for me, an act of moral irresponsibility. It's, it's a cop out. Um, ASEAN has not got the capacity, nor does it have the poli political willingness uh, to uh, to, to bring about the uh, a, a change in the situation in Myanmar. What one can hope from ASEAN is to be able to facilitate humanitarian assistance. But again, um, this is really comes down in the end, you know, to Thailand uh, uh, as the only, you know, as the ASEAN country with borders, uh, it, it comes down to political decisions within Thailand itself. Um, with perhaps some encouragement from other ASEAN members. Um, but anyway, that's my re reply to Christine's question to me. I think uh, somebody, um, yeah. So are there other comments and questions? Oh, I, I, can I ask the panelists? Oh yes, we have a, a Ung uh, Hai uh, Mint has put up his hand. I, I, and can you ask a question? And I also like to have the re response of the of the Burmese uh, Myanmar participant panelists uh, uh, to this notion of recognizing the NUG. You know, is, is this is this a good idea, or do you think it's a bad idea, or it's really not going to change anything? Okay, thank you very much, and I, I just want to make some points and uh, some questions. The first. So the Myanmar crisis is not just a political operation because so the military hunter kid because they want to kill that shooting you know a car or motorbikes in Mandalay broad in broad daylight or or killing a baby in the arms of her fa her father so because they kill because they want to kill they kill because they like to kill and another one is the terminology uh, the damage. Damador literally means Ryan Army, which is 
the army of the people, the army of the state. And, and, and the people in Myanmar do not use them at all when, when we refer to them. Because you know, saying, using the word them at all means supporting them, standing with them. So, so I would say that we, we, we should use you know, like army or, or Myanmar army or, or Myanmar hunter army, and that is, and that is the better usage. And then the, the, the uh, okay. So, uh, and, uh, and, and the, the, the rule of ASEAN, and David has said that uh, this, uh, the ASEAN is not a good partner to rely, to rely on uh, for, to, for democracy. And uh, so when we, when we say ASEAN is not very supportive and, and I just want to uh, listen to more which countries are not supported and which countries are supporting. And, and I want to um, uh, understand the complexity of Myanmar political crisis. When we talk about political crisis in Myanmar and, and many people will say it's very complex and, and it's multi dynamics. And uh, sometimes leaving, uh, leaving you know, that complexity away, uh, it doesn't uh, uh, make uh, any problem solved. So, so when we say the complexity and what, what complexity and what can we do about that? And then the role of China and Russia. So, and, and, in, and in February and March, we people uh, hold a signs, you know, saying UN or, or right to responsibility or RTP in, in the in thousands and thousands of people in, in the whole country, in the streets of big cities and small cities as well. And, and on Sunlight on Sunlight Strike Day, there was no pausing in all the streets of Myanmar. So, but the UN was uh, UN, I think, is stuck. And in Myanmar, we say UN is being worried all the time, and he, then they might get some depression or diseases. So, so what what UN could do about Myanmar, and is UN is really working to solve the problem in the war? Is the UN is useless, or, or can we can we rely? Or, or, or does a country can rely on a, a UN uh, to solve the, the political crisis in the country because it seems that it's stuck in, in international politics? Uh, uh, yes, thank you very much. Yes. Okay, I think uh, that uh, Den Chen wanted to say something again or intervene. Can uh, yeah, can we put that back? Ah, you're back. Okay. Yes, I figured out how to raise my hand. Um, I think my question would be maybe either both or either uh, Miss Kinoma and Mr. Kasumon. Uh, um, basically, I was wondering about you know we've used terminology like refugees or dissident or people who are persecuted or migrant workers, economic migrants. But I'm wondering uh, from your point of view, when people do cross over into, from Myanmar into Thailand, do they, are they like thinking about these sort of legal designations for these words? Like what, as you know, what, and certainly the Thai border authorities, they're kind of all classifying them as, um, um, economic migrants or illegal migrants or whatever. So I'm wondering from your point of view, um, where you work with people who are either coming across the border or are being persecuted or are also migrant laborers, what terminology should, would they want to be called or what should we call them? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very interesting question, which touched upon this, this notion that uh, Francois Robin uh, uh, the, the, the notion of refugees is a term that people take a, posto a posteriori. Uh, uh, it's not a term that you know, we impose on them. But so what is your feeling about that, Kasumon and Kinoma? Uh, yeah, let me say first. Uh, so we know that uh, for the Thai government, it's normally they uh, refer those people across the border and trying to find a job in Thailand as a illegal migrant worker. So that's it. Uh, 
those who have no paper, no passport, and no MOU agree. So they are illegal to cross into Thailand, and then they can be uh, taken action according to the law. But uh, after the coup, so as far as we know, not a leader level, many the follower level, the young activists, like they are not in the leader, they are, but they are, they feel they are under threat. So they are mixing with the migrant worker to Thailand. So there are some CDM staff uh, who are involved in the movement, some, uh, but what I, what I see from Thai authority and Thai army, they are not screening them. They are not screening them. They are all defined as migrant worker. So they will check them. They will check their status, whether they have passport or MOU or whatever. So if they have nothing, so they can be arrested. Uh, they, they will put quarantine center. Even in the quarantine center, they are not defined them or classifying them. Uh, you are activists or not. And also at the same time, the people or the CDM, CDM staff or young student or Gen Z who are going along those migrant workers are not identify themselves they are involved in the anti-coup. So they never do that because they are so, they're not trapped to the Thai authority, to the Thai government, to the Thai police. So they, they worry they will be deposed back into the, into the hand of Bami Sami. So that's, that's it, they worry because uh, in the local politics, in the regional politics, uh, many people know this, the, 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 the Myanmar uh, military genders and Thai government is close. They have close relation, so the people understand like that. So as I said before, so even though after the coup, Thai government trying to step up to receive refugee fleeing from the political persecution in Thailand about 10 locations a long time by my border. No people come. No people join into that come because they don't want to identify that they are involved in the anti-coup to the Thai authority. They are always concerned about it. So, so I, now, you, get, you get my, my answer. Okay, Kinama, would you like to come in on that? Um, I, yeah, I agree with uh, Siaka Salmon also. Um, people, I, first of all, when people uh, cross the border, I, I, I mean, like I crossed the border too. I didn't think of like, you know, what will I be calling myself? I mean, I had no idea about these norms and terms and terminologies. And, you know, it's just for me, it's like try to actually, um, you know, like, uh, yeah, like f to find a, a, a security really, like, you know, for the safety as the, the army is behind. So that's the case for uh, those who are fleeing also, um, who were, who've been fleeing for the past few months as well. Um, like Goka Solomon said, I also see that it's, it, people don't want to be uh, identified of their, um, their political involvement or the uh, knowing of, I mean, at least I think because of the social media also, there's been news, you know, like uh, being covered in the news about how the Myanmar, uh, Myanmar the military hunter and the Thai military are so close. So there've been a lot of this kind of information being spread. So people are very careful about, you know, their identity not to be exposed as it is to the ties. Uh, so I think that's one, one, one of the reason, but of course, I mean, like, you know, for us as the, uh, uh, our, like a women umbrella called Women's League of Brahma, we have our own definition of what refugee means. And, you know, which is not necessarily, you know, according to the UN, based on the reality of our people on the ground. Mm -hmm. So for the, the people who are fleeing, are actually the like Goka Salman said, they are the, uh, the the political refugees or people who are fleeing from their violence and persecution, and that need to be protected. 
And yet, you know, I mean, as we all know, the you know, like that the Thailand will never call even those in the camps as the refugees, or you know, those camps were never called as refugee camps. So it's been uh, quite challenging. But I think at the moment, um, I think we really need to uh, like you know also advocate to the Thai government. You know, after all, you know, for many years they've 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 deal with the uh, spillover, <clears throat> spillover effects from Myanmar, Burma, and they're not new to these crises. Um, it's always also in the interest for them, you know, to actually show the mercy and show their international responsibility. I think that is what the, the Thai government need to hear. They have the international responsibility as a member of the, the United Nations and, you know, member of the international community to protect the people who are fleeing. And yet, we're not really seeing that also, you know, moving on that, that side. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we've already 10 minutes over time, but we did begin 10 minutes late. So uh, we're trying to compensate a little bit for that. Um, there is a question. Uh, it's not re directly related to questions about borders and refugees, but from Miles Jury, I'll read it out to, to you. Uh, the Sangha, the Mankud are a huge political force in the country and have been central to large uh, uprisings in the past, for example, in 1988 and in 2007. Why do they seem to be less mobilized since the February 1st coup, and what might be holding them back? So it's this, this concerning the Sangha and the Mankud and, uh, and their behavior this time around. That's a very complex question, but I'll ask you to answer it in, in a couple of minutes each, please. Uh, it's, I you know, will try. Simone. I did it. I'm not so sure because yeah, someone wanted to also uh, share some thoughts over it. But in my observation is, first of all, the, the Sanghas and the monks, they've been at the forefront along with their laymen and women since the, 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 the after the coup attempt. So many of them have been um, also arrested and detained and also okay. all even in prison. But you're right, compared to the 2007 Saffron Revolution where you know, like tens of thousands of monks were on the street. We don't see that possibility. One possibility is that in the last months of the quote unquote uh, reform or the transition time, the military was able to well utilize the public, including the Sangha, with this uh, Buddhist uh, ideology uh, to, you know, like a, a kind of to mobilize them as a part of their civilian wing in their agenda to advance the country as the Buddhist Burma nation, which is which has always been a political project of the military all along. So in that Buddhist Burma project, um, a Buddhist Burma, uh, a Buddhist Burmanization kind of project for the, the military, they need the Buddhists, whether the monks or the lay person on their side, you see. So they really mobilize, whereas the, the people also, you know, with this very devout kind of traditional Buddhist uh, thinking, Think that you know the others, meaning like the uh, Christianity or the Muslims, are not in the equal set. Whereas, particularly for the Christian, I mean, for the Muslim community, are seen as um, an enemy. Uh, you know, the others who are going to destroy the race and religion of uh, Myanmar, Burma. I think that that ultra nationalist Buddhist uh, agenda has been well utilized and politicized by the military. And you see that also that is one of the key um, implementing factor of the military in their, uh, their uh, genocide campaign, the mm -hmm. clearance operations against the, uh, the Rohingya in 2017 and onward. Yeah. So it could be that. Yeah. Okay. So a divided uh, Sangha, a divided monkhood, which was not the case um, in, in 2007 and in 1988. And yes. just, just, yeah, very, very uh, last point, very quickly. Also, the uh, the military portray the NLD and Don San Suu Kyi as, uh, you know, who are pro-Muslim, who are going to destroy our country's race and religion. So they always use this Muslim card against Aung San Suu Kyi and yeah. NLD, even though that is not entirely true. So, yeah. Kasuma, yeah. you have the final word. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I agree with uh, Kilma. So when we look back to 2007, so normally the 
at that time in the pro, pro democracy movement. So we have no leadership. So NAD leaders are all in detention and all the political activists are, are under oppression. So the Hmong came up, especially young Hmong, you know, especially young Hmong, not a, so in the Buddhist community, there are like elderly monks and young monks. So as far as I know, the young monks are very clear on the political process. They are involved in the, in the pro-democracy movement. So they have helping a lot of anti-coup activists to hide or to, to provide uh, safety and shelter during this, after 2010, uh, military coup. But however, uh, hierarchy of the Buddhist uh, community is uh, the young ones never uh, convinced or complain or, or like uh, yeah, the, the motivate uh, other man to get involved. So as said, uh, the, the military junta, they are, the military junta or Burmese army leaders, uh, they are organized, uh, the young uh, senior man uh, so in their pocket, so, and they are raising about the, uh, 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 yeah, Burman national, nationalism to them. So, yeah, a light camera. So, Francois, yeah. would you like to add something on this and um, on this question of the monkhood and its role? Uh, no, I'd j just like to say about the terminology used uh, when we speak together as uh, the word uh, refugee. Refugee is already uh, a, a word used by uh, intellectual um, and uh, European or Occidental or Burmese uh, coming from the cities. But uh, refugee, of course, on the border, when they have people are fleeing, fighting, and so on, maybe they call, describe them, themselves uh, as a refugee. But, but majority of the mi migrant people, transnational migrant people, uh, call themselves Shepian uh, Alotema, uh, it means uh, uh, economic migrants, workers migrants. It's very, it's very important because there is no, if you are going in the village, in the highlands of Burma, in uh, any places, really the villages are empty of the young generation for not only for, for many uh, years ago, but it's only because there is, there are, these people are jobless. Whatever the political regime, dictatorship, or any other regime, and the migration is economic migration. Of course, even on the background, there is political reason for the migration. But the, these people are not educated people for most of them, you know, and so it's, they have no political... Uh, uh, thinking about uh, where of uh, uh, the only thinking is uh, to go abroad to find a work and to help their own uh, family and people. So they are they describe never the political reasons appear in their terminology. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Francois. And, and it was rather. Uh, a nice way of ending our discussion because we began with, a, in a sense, the, the broad overview and it's perhaps a more theoretical or conceptual approach. And then to end with that also, I think it's very helpful because what we've been able to see is that we can have these wonderful concepts of, of a particular situation. But as the the presentations of our Myanmar friends have indicated that underneath this are human beings and it's ultimately it's it's an individual human story or story of families of peoples uh, and that beyond the statistics and the, the conceptualizations is the human reality um, and I'm very pleased that our discussion has enable us to look into that human reality. Thank you all for participating in this, uh, 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 in the 
in both in the panel and also the, the participants and for your contributions. We apologize for some of the technical hitches that occurred. Um, and I just hope that uh, we may meet in happier circumstances uh, in Yangon or Mandalay. Uh, and uh, when uh, what we hope will occur uh, and this, this, the, 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 tra the democratic transition that has been stolen from the people of Myanmar is, is returned to them. So thank you very much for participating, for the panelists for participating. Thank you for those who have actively watched and contributed and uh, all the best, I guess it's the evening in, in Bangkok. Um, for those of us in Europe, uh, it's the afternoon. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, the organizers, uh, particularly of, of Rusek, uh, um, Samuel and, and, and uh, Christine, and, and for the team in Chiang Mai uh, for their preliminary work. Thanks very much indeed. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Bye. Merci beaucoup. Thanks, everyone.